Welcome to the next video in the evolution series. This video will be looking at three dot points from the Evolution of Australian Biota syllabus 8.5.21, discuss examples of variation between members of a species. 8.5.22, identify the relationship between the variation between variation within a species and the chances of survival when the environment changes. And 8.5.2e, perform a first-hand investigation to gather information of examples of variation in at least two species of living organism. So we're going to start off by having a look at the theory dot points. So discuss examples of variation and identify the relationships between variation and the chances of survival. So what is variation? Although we are all homo sapiens, as we know from our classification videos, there are many different variations that exist within the human population, just as there are within all the species, all different species. So if you were just to have a look in, around your family, you obviously all come from a very similar genetic, or all come from the same genetic gene pool. However, there are slight variations between each of you, things like hair color, eye color, your predisposition or height and weight, you, whether you write with your left hand, whether you write with your right hand, your ability to see long and short distances, all these things are variations. So variations within populations are vital for the ongoing survival of the species. When changes occur in the environment, a species with lots of variation has more chance to survive because out of all the different types of organisms, there is a good chance that at least some of these will survive to breed and continue the species. So obviously a species with very little variation may have no survivors after an environmental change and become extinct. So we can go back and look at the time of the dinosaurs where there's lots of different theories about why the dinosaurs disappeared off the face of the earth. But in particular, one could have been the massive change in temperature that occurred at the time. So dinosaurs we know are reptiles, they're cold blooded, so they're not able to maintain their body temperature without using the environment. So if the environment, the temperature of the environment dropped considerably, these organisms wouldn't be able to handle that. However, over time, there was some variation within the different species of dinosaurs, and some of them may have developed a layer of hair or fur, and that would have allowed them to be insulated and survive that massive change. So what about some particular variations within individual species? So one type of variation that we know is called sexual dimorphism. So this occurs when there's a variation between males and females of the same species. So it can be based on different things such as color, size, courtship or territorial behaviors. So as we can see in the picture, we've got two different species represented. We have lions here, whereas we can see the male is much larger than the female. Also, the male has this really prominent mane around its head, whereas our female doesn't have such um, sort of a, an outward appearance. Okay, males obviously have much stronger bodies, so they're a lot more muscular than the females. And that means that obviously the males that are stronger, fitter, are the ones that will reproduce and pass those strong and fit genes onto their offspring. The other example that we have here is a, is, are our peacocks. And as we can see in the front here, we have a female peacock, which is quite boring and dull in its color, whereas the male peacock has this really bright, bright plumage that is able to attract a mate during courtship rituals. So also we have variation based on geological location. So animals in cooler areas are usually larger than those in warmer areas. Variation in colouring to assist with camouflage. So for example, the western grey kangaroo is darker with thicker fur in forest dwelling populations, while those that live in more open habitats are lighter with thinner fur. So there's a variation right within that grey kangaroo population. So we don't have different species. We just have different variations of individuals within that species. Gradual changes in the characteristics of the snow gum. So snow gum is a tree that grows in cold climates, depending on the altitude that it's growing at. So as we get higher, the branches get thicker to handle the weight of the snow. The trunk changes color. The leaves drop at different times in comparison to those at lower altitudes. We also have variations of pop within populations of birds that allow them to access food available in those particular locations. And one of the prime examples of this 
uh, the Galapagos finches. So Charles Darwin noticed that there was a species of finch on various islands of the Galapagos archipelago and each one of the islands, the finches had slightly different beak shape, which allowed them to catch the food on that particular island. So again, they all started as the same species, but those that had the particular beak shapes for those islands were able to survive, reproduce and pass those characteristics on to their offspring. So what happens when we don't have variation within a species? So at the moment, we know that the Tasmanian devil is suffering and become and has become an endangered species. So what is causing this, these high rates of death is this deadly facial tumour disease, which we can see in the picture is quite horrific. So genetic studies are showing that the lack of variation between the individual devils of the Tasmanian devil species is a major impediment to, the, to its survival. So the ability to breed resistant populations is restricted due to the lack of variation, particularly in the key genes for the immune system. So what they're trying to do is they're starting really specific breeding programs in captivity where they're finding these um, devils that are immune or have that higher immunity to this disease and trying to breed them and increase the population before they release them back into the wild. We also have an issue of variation amongst Tasmania's population of platypus. So obviously Tasmania is isolated from Australia. So these organisms don't come in contact with the normal, or not the not normal, but with the uh, usual population of other organisms. And they're not exposed to these things to build up immunity, to build these variations within their population. So at the moment, the platypuses in Tasmania are succumbing to a fatal fungal disease. It is believed to be a result of their isolation from other populations of platypus. So this particular population of platypus did not develop resistance to the fungus that is carried in different groups of frogs and toads. The mainland platypus are more varied and are resistant to the disease so far. So at the moment, they're coping. There's enough variation with the population that they've been able to pass on this resistant gene to their offspring. Um, however, there are still the odd platypus that um, die. And as we know, as we as you may know, funguses and bacteria and things can change and could mean that the platypus will also need to evolve as the disease changes. The Wallamai pine is a group of trees that used to grow quite um have sorry quite a great distribution across australia but has now become restricted to several areas in the wild and it is believed to be genetically a clone so all the different plants are just believed to have come from the same individual plant as there is no genetic variation between individual plants if the climate continues to dry so as we know australia is moving northwards at you know a couple of centimeters per year the chances of survival in the wild is very slow so people are trying to clone them to create more individuals. However, because they're um, being cloned artificially, and as we know, a clone is a genetic copy. So again, by cloning them, there's no variation. So if there was to be a massive shift in Australia's climate, these clones are not going to be able to survive. So why is it important? As we know, evolution hinges on the concept of natural selection, and the key to the idea of natural selection is variation. So natural selection is the theory put forward by Charles Darwin and refers to the way that the conditions of nature constantly select who survives and who dies. And because we don't really know what's going to happen in the future, it's difficult to predict what characteristics might help survival because it all depends on what happens in the environment. So let's look at quickly at the relationship between variation and survival. So variations within populations are vital for the ongoing survival of the species. Based on Darwin's theory of natural selection, a species with lots of variation has more chance to survive as at least some of these organisms will be able to withstand any environmental change or a specific environmental change. They will then be able to reproduce and pass these favorable traits onto their offspring whereas a species with little variation might not have any survivors from an environmental change and end up becoming extinct. So along with this, we also need to perform a first-hand investigation to gather information of examples of variation in at least two species of living organisms. 
So our aim is to observe variations in at least two species of living organisms. So our materials, multiple specimens from an animal species, and in our case, we're just going to use humans, multiple specimens from a plant species. So you can use any plant species that you're able to access. Ideally, an Australian species would be best. A hand lens to be able to look at your plants and rulers to be able to make some quantitative um, measurements. And so the method, you're going to collect qualitative and quantitative data from both species. You're going to place the collected data into a table and then you're going to use the skills that you created or developed in the classification section to create a dichotomous key of the animal species only. So when we're looking at our different species, for humans, we can measure things like their height, we can look at their eye colour, their foot length, whether they're male or female, and the length between their shoulder to their elbow. So there's a whole range of different things that you could look at for variations. These are just a few. Again, qualitative are things where we um, make observations with our eyes, ears, nose, etc. So um, eye colour, hair colour, and whether they're male or female is obviously qualitative and measuring things like their height, their foot length, the shoulder to elbow measurement are obviously quantitative data. We then look at our plant species and things that we can look at can include the length of leaves, the color of the petals, the length of the petals, the length of their sepals, the flower color, the color of the leaves and the number of leaves in a particular section of a branch. So you can choose any of the different um, characteristics of plants that you would like to do, but they're the five that we are going to look at when we do our first-hand investigation in class to look at variations amongst the human population. And that brings us to the end of this video. Thank you for watching.